Grid modernization is a hot topic in electronic engineering today. Well, in the rest of society, too. I have had more conversations about the grid lately than I can count. Yes, we need to modernize the grid. But just how are we going to do that? And how did we get in this predicament in the first place? Well, step right up, my friends. We're talking about all of this and more. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Jock Talk. The power grid is struggling to meet the growing demands of our electrifying world. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Jake Michaels from the Yagio Group joins me to discuss the challenges affecting our power grids today, the solutions to help solve these issues, and why passive components will be the heroes of grid modernization. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from the Yagio Group. Hi, Jake. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi. I'm happy to be here. So we're talking about power gridlock today and the power grid struggle to meet the demands of an electrifying world. But Jake, before we get started, can you give us some background on the power grid? Absolutely. I can walk us through a little bit of a brief synopsis of how the power grid started to form and the early stages of what our power grid was shown. Starting off with our power grids, we started with a power generator, right? Some source of electricity, whether that be a hydroelectric dam or a lot of cases in the early stages, it was a coal-fired plant. That power gets transferred to a substation. And then that substation branches off and powers our homes and our factories and all the other things that we can think of. And initially, these started in cities, right? So we had a one or two power generator plants that would branch off to a couple different substations that branched off into the city. But if any of those power generators had any issues and we lost power or there was a break in the line, there was nothing to supplement that power loss. And so we would essentially, we would lose all of the housing if one power generator in a city went down. This was one of Edison's early problems is he had lots and lots of power outages because he only had one power generator and he was trying to stretch it a really long distance. He was also using DC, which might not have been his ideal case. As we know now, we use AC power because we don't get any losses over long distances compared to DC. So that's how these kind of started. And then eventually we thought, well, it would be smart if we tied into the other city a couple miles away. And so eventually we started to slowly tie these multiple grids into one another. And eventually we came into the system that we have today. So on this next slide, I show a map of the United States and partially of Canada that demonstrates all of the different grids we now have. So if you're like I'm originally from Montana, my power grid was shown up in the green and my power could be coming all the way from Nevada to my Montana home as well. And as, if you were in like North Dakota, you'd be in the red. So that's kind of how these started to form. And this is the standard system that we have now in place. So Jake, we're seeing an ever increasing demand for electricity, right? Yeah. And actually that's a really interesting point. So my grandfather... In rural America, electricity is still being pulled out to those areas. And in the early 50s, my grandfather actually sat on a co-op board in his local community to get power out to his ranch. <laughs> and so we are still adding electrical output to our grids, and our grids are continually growing. Especially with the emergence of like electric cars and all those other things, we really are seeing a crazy amount of growth. Sure. Now, what kind of energy sources are we looking at for this demand? And that's the other thing. We've diversified into our sources, right? It's not smart to have all of our electricity be created by coal, because what if there's a coal shortage or something? So a smart grid, an intelligent grid manager, will have multiple types of sources of electricity. So we have the EIA actually shows a chart here with the wind, petroleum, solar, natural gas, hydro, coal, and nuclear. One of the games that these grid managers have to play is load and demand management. They cannot overproduce electricity because that would short circuit the grid, and they can't underproduce because then you would get brownouts in the system. 
And so the controller's game every day, all day long, is to match the electricity demand with the net generation. And so those lines have to match all day long. And when you look at our day-to-day basis, we actually have a cycle. So our peak usage is at like 6 p.m. when everybody goes home and they you know, throw in a load of laundry, they do some dishes, they take a shower, they run their hot water heaters, they turn on the TV. We see peaks at that time and then dips in the middle of the night. That's when we have our lowest output power. And so these controller managers, these electrical controllers, they are playing the ramping up and ramping down game with multiple sources in a grid matrix all day long. So if you take a look at the U.S. electricity generation by energy source chart, you can see there are certain types of energy that we ramp heavily, and there are certain types of energy that we try to keep at stable levels. For example, nuclear is extremely hard to ramp up and ramp down safely. So in the U.S., we pretty much keep the amount of energy that the nuclear plants are implementing into the grid very, very stable. With natural gas and other things, we are easily can ramp those up and down. And so if you look at the top of the chart, you can see the ramping up and down of the natural gas. If you look down at the bottom of that chart, though, this is the really interesting part. The green and the yellow lines are, the green is wind and the yellow is solar. And solar is actually not peaking exactly on the peaks in which the grid is demanding. So that'll play a crucial role in one of our problems that we'll talk about later. Interesting. Now, what about the different regions within the United States? Are you seeing any specific problems in these specific areas? So actually, this moves into the duck curve problem, which is an issue that we're struggling with right now, basically everywhere, but it's very, very pronounced in California. So California had early adoption for a lot of solar energy, and we've come up with this name for the problem. It's called the duck curve. And as we've added solar energy production into our grid, we've seen a dip in the amount of load each day right around at the peak hours of solar generation. And this is a problem for our grid managers because they are trying to balance and not ramp down things like nuclear power plants. They don't want to turn them off because it's really hard to turn them back on again. And so anywhere we've seen rapid solar adoption, we've seen this duck curve problem begin to emerge where we, in the peak of our day, in the middle of the sunniest part of the day, we have a drastic drop in load and we almost have to turn off all of the other production sources. One of the ways to solve this would be storage. And we haven't quite addressed that yet as a country, but it is coming and we will have to do that if we want to continue to further implement solar into our power grid productions. The other problem we have is a current limiting problem. We had a newspaper drawing of the forecasted grid in New York City. It was a complaining piece to Edison's grid drawing what we would someday visualize in the New York Cityscape. And it never did quite come to fruition, but I did manage to take a picture of Nova Scotia when I was visiting earlier this year. And we've already kind of reached that limit. And the limit is how many lines we can put on a pole. So especially in these downtown populated areas, we need to be able to put more power into that area without adding more lines to the pole. So essentially, we're stuck in a gridlock. We can no longer add any more lanes to the highway on these poles. We just have to manage our traffic flow better. Okay, so Jake, let's talk about some solutions to attack these issues head on. Absolutely. So the three base problems that we need to tackle when we're looking at this is we need to be able to increase the amount of renewables that we use in our grid. We need a demand for increased storage. We need some batteries, whether that be chemical or gravity potential batteries or what have you. We need more batteries. And then we also need a bi-directional system. And I'll get more into what that means in a second. So in a smart grid system, we would start again with our power generation. And that would move again into a substation. That substation would branch and go to all our homes and factories and have all the cars and everything on it. We still have our pre-existing grid tie that ties to all the other producers in the area. 
And now we've been able to put solar panels on the roof of even residential homes and a battery. So we've got all the pieces into this puzzle we want, but the problem starts to emerge even to a greater degree when we add EV chargers to all of these houses, and then we start to add the communications of the EV chargers into the homes, we now start to see an emergence of data that we need to start to track. Because in order to allow a residential home or a factory to implement power into the grid, they need to understand the amount of demand required at that time. So all these systems have to be in balance and we start to trade data across the whole network, right? All the way from the EV charger in the home, all the way up to the substation, into the power generator so that they can ramp up and ramp down so that we're constantly playing that demand and net production game where we're matching identically all across the grid. But by doing so, with all of this data transmission that we'd be doing, this would allow us to, say, regulate and monitor the amount of production going through a particular area. For example, let's say there's 15 people on a street that all have electric cars. Their current standing power grid won't be able to sustain that much load all at the same time. So with this data and the idea of the smart grid is that we can slowly control and charge all of the vehicles on the street one at a time or maybe two at a time or however the math works out. But essentially, we'd be able to control when and where the load gets distributed. And then all of these systems, of course, would be bi-directional. So we can charge in any direction. The power can go from the battery into the grid or from the grid into the battery and from your home to your neighbor's home or what have you, depending on how you looked at it. So what kind of solutions does the Yagio Group have to help solve these issues? So there are two major ways to look at the Yagio Group's solutions. We have digital architecture solutions and then power solutions. From the digital architecture perspective, I've shown a block chart of all the products that we have. We have all of the passive components that would go into an input stage, into a switch tank converter, into the various versions of a DC to DC converter, or if you're plugged into the wall, an AC converter. We have a flex suppressor, which is a suppressant sheet that can stop EMI noise from other devices. And then, of course, all of the inputs and outputs that can additionally be placed into the system, whether that be the antennas or the connectors or the sensors or the R45 jacks, the LAN transformers, all these different passive pieces of a digital system, which is mostly what this smart grid will be built on, right, is all of this data. And this is how we support the smart grid emergence into our society, is that we provide all of these passive components that can help this transmission of data. And then looking at the power conversion side, my other block diagram, this is a bi-directional circuit diagram. If it's moving from left to right, it's a converter. It takes AC power and turns it into DC power to either charge the battery in your EV or run a motor in a factory. And then in reverse, if you run the circuit from right to left, it becomes an inverter where the DC power generated from a solar plant can be implemented into the grid. And by doing so, we do that with safety caps. We do that with AC harmonic filters, oxide varistors, discharge tubes, all sorts of inductors, isolation transformers, DC link capacitors, what have you. We have the whole gambit of passive solutions for that whole problem from end to end. And so that's how Yagio Group fits in. And all of these products are available on Mauser. Well, excellent. I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Jake. Thank you. (laughs) Wonderful to be here. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from the Yagio Group. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash 